In the name of Allah the Most Beneficent, the Most Merciful, Allah be praised. Blessings and salutations upon the Masterpiece Hazrat Muhammad. Peace be upon him, and upon his entire household, and upon his companions, and upon the righteous people, who strive so hard in bringing this peaceful religion to us, and upon whole Muslim Amma. It's an attempt to tell this world the flawless life of beloved Prophet Hazrat Muhammad. Peace be upon him, who has been sent to guide the humanity and to put the straight on the right way, the way to eternal heaven. It is also aimed at attaining all his mercy in this world and hereafter. The book chosen for this purpose is Ar Rahik al Muqtam, The Sealed Nectar, the best ever book written on the biography of beloved Prophet Hazrat Muhammad, peace be upon him. Ar Rahik al Muqtam was awarded first prize by the Muslim World League at Worldwide Competition on the Biography of the Prophet Muhammad. Peace be upon him, held at Makkah al Mukarama in 1399 Hijri. Chapter 3 Religions of the Arabs. Most of the Arabs had complied with the call of Ishmael. Peace be upon him and professed the religion of his father Abraham. Peace be upon him, they had worshipped Allah, professed his oneness and followed his religion a long time until they forgot part of what they had been reminded of. However, they still maintained such fundamental beliefs such as monotheism as well as various other aspects of Abraham's religion. Until the time when a chief of Kuzas, namely, Amr bin Luhai, who was renowned for righteousness, charity, reverence and care for religion, and was granted unreserved love and obedience by his tribesmen, came back from a trip to Syria where he saw people worship idols. A phenomenon he approved of and believed it to be righteous since Syria was the locus of messengers and scriptures. He brought with him an idol, Hubal, which he placed in the middle of al kaaba and summoned people to worship it. Readily enough, paganism spread all over Makkah and thence to he as people of Makkah being custodians of not only the sacred house but the whole harem as well. A great many idols, bearing different names, were introduced into the area. An idol called Manat, for instance, was worshipped in a place known as al mushal near Qadid on the Red Sea. Another, Al-Lot in Taif, a third, Al-Uzza in the Valley of Nakla, and so on and so forth. Polytheism prevailed and the number of idols increased everywhere in Hiyas. It was even mentioned that, Amr bin Luhai, with the help of a jinn companion who told him that the idols of Nose Folk Wad, Suwit, Yagath, Yauk and Nasser, were buried in Jeddah, dug them out and took them to Tihama. Upon pilgrimage time, the idols were distributed among the tribes to take back home. Every tribe and house had their own idols, and the sacred house was also overcrowded with them. On the Prophet's conquest of Makkah, 360 idols were found around al kaaba He broke them down and had them removed and burned up. Polytheism and worship of idols became the most prominent feature of the religion of pre-Islam Arabs despite alleged profession of Abraham's religion. Traditions and ceremonies of the worship of their idols had been mostly created by Amr bin Luhai and were deemed as good innovations rather than deviations from Abraham's religion. Some features of their worship of idols were 1. Self-devotion to the idols. Seeking refuge with them. Acclamation of their names calling for their help and hardship, and supplication to them for fulfillment of wishes, hopefully that the idols, i.e., heathen gods, would mediate with Allah for the fulfillment of people's wishes. 2. Performing pilgrimage to the idols, circumrotation round them, self-abasement and even prostrating themselves before them. 3. Seeking favor of idols through various kinds of sacrifices and immolations, which is mentioned in the Quranic verses. And that which is sacrificed, slaughtered, on a nusab, stone altars, 5-3. Allah also says, Eat not, O believers, of that meat on which Allah's name has not been pronounced at the time of the slaughtering of the animal. 6. 121. 4. Consecration of certain portions of food, drink, cattle, and crops to idols. Surprisingly enough, portions were also consecrated to Allah himself, but people often found reasons to transfer parts of Allah's portion to idols, but never did the opposite. To this effect, the Quranic verses go and they assign to Allah a share of the tilth and cattle which he has created, and they say, This is for Allah according to their pretending, and this is for our, Allah's so-called partners. But the share of their, Allah's so-called partners, reaches not Allah, while the share of Allah reaches their, Allah's so-called partners. Evil is the way they judge. 6. 136. 5. Currying favors with these idols through votive offerings of crops and cattle, to which effect the Quran goes. 
and according to their pretending, they say that such and such cattle and crops are forbidden, and none should eat of them except those whom we allow. And they say, there are cattle forbidden to be used for burden or any other work, and cattle on which, at slaughtering, the name of Allah is not pronounced, lying against him, Allah. 6. 138. 6. Dedication of certain animals, such as Bahira, S-A-I-B-A, Wasilla and Hamid to idols, which meant sparing such animals from useful work for the sake of these heathen gods. Bahira, is reported by the well-known historian, Ibn Ish, was daughter of S-A-I-B-A which was a female camel that gave birth to ten successive female animals. But no male ones, was set free and forbidden to yoke. Burden are being sheared off its wool, or milked but for guests to drink from, and so was done to all her female offspring which were given the name, Bahira, after having their ears slit. The Wasilla was a female sheep which had ten successive female daughters in five pregnancies. Any new births from this Wasilla were assigned only for male people. The Hami was a male camel which produced ten progressive females, and was thus similarly forbidden. In mention of this, the Quranic verses go. Allah has not instituted things like Bahira, a she-camel whose milk was spared for the idols and nobody was allowed to milk it. Or ASAIBA, a she-camel let loose for free pasture for their false gods, e.g. idols, etc., and nothing was allowed to be carried on it. Or a Wasilla, a she-camel set free for idols because it has given birth to a she-camel at its first delivery and then again gives birth to a she-camel at its second delivery. Or a ham. A stallion camel freed from work for their idols. After it had finished a number of copulations assigned for it, all these animals were liberated in honor of idols as practiced by pagan Arabs in the pre-Islamic period. But those who disbelieve, invent lies against Allah, and most of them have no understanding. 5.103 Allah also says, and they say, what is in the bellies of such and such cattle, milk or fetus, is for our males alone, and forbidden to our females, girls and women, but if it is born dead, then all have shares therein. 6. 139. It has been authentically reported that such superstitions were first invented by Amr bin Luhai. The Arabs believed that such idols, or heathen gods, would bring them nearer to Allah, lead them to him, and mediate with him for their sake, to which effect the Quran goes. We worship them only that they may bring us near to Allah. 39, 3, and, and they worship besides all the things that hurt them not nor profit them, and they say, these are our intercessors with Allah. 10, 18, another divinatory tradition among the Arabs was casting of Aslam, i.e., featherless arrows which were of three kinds, one showing, yes, another, no, and a third was blank, which they used to do in case of serious matters like travel, marriage and the like. If the lot showed, yes, they would do, if no, they would delay for the next year. Other kinds of Aslam were cast for water, blood money or showed, from you, not from you, or, Malsak consociated. In cases of doubt and filiation they would resort to the idol of Hubal, with a hundred camel gift for the arrow caster. Only the arrows would then decide the sort of relationship. If the arrow showed, from you, then it was decided that the child belonged to the tribe, if it showed. From others, he would then be regarded as an ally, but if consociated, appeared, the person would retain his position but with no lineage or alliance contract. This was very much like gambling and arrow shafting whereby they used to divide the meat of the camels they slaughtered according to this tradition. Moreover, they used to have a deep conviction in the tidings of soothsayers, diviners and astrologers. A soothsayer used to traffic in the business of foretelling future events and claim knowledge of private secrets and having jinn subordinates who would communicate the news to him. Some soothsayers claimed that they could uncover the unknown by means of a granted power. While other diviners boasted they could divulge the secrets through a cause and effect inductive process that would lead to detecting a stolen commodity, location of a theft, a stray animal, and the like. The astrologer belonged to a third category who used to observe the stars and calculate their movements and orbits whereby he would foretell the future. Lending credence to this news constituted a clue to their conviction that attached special significance to the movements of particular stars with regard to rainfall. The belief in signs as betokening future events was, of course, common among the Arabians. Some days and months in particular animals were regarded as ominous. They also believed that the soul of a murdered person would fly in the wilderness and would never rest at rest until revenge was taken. Superstition was rampant. Should a deer or bird, when released, turn right then what they embarked on would be regarded auspicious, otherwise they would get pessimistic and withhold from pursuing it.
People of pre-Islamic period, whilst believing in superstition, they still retained some of the Abrahamic traditions such as devotion to the holy sanctuary, circumambulation, observance of pilgrimage, the vigil on Arafah and offering sacrifices, all of these were observed fully despite some innovations that adulterated these holy rituals. Quraysh, for example, out of arrogance, feeling of superiority to other tribes and pride in their custodianship of the sacred house would refrain from going to Arafah with the crowd, instead they would stop short at Muzdalifah. The noble Quran rebuked and told them, then depart from the place whence all the people depart. 2. 199. Another heresy, deeply established in their social tradition, dictated that they would not eat dried yogurt or cooked fat, nor would they enter a tent made of camel hair or seek shade unless in a house of adobe bricks, so long as they were committed to the intention of pilgrimage. They also, out of a deeply rooted misconception, denied pilgrims, other than Mackins, access to the food they had brought when they wanted to make pilgrimage or lesser pilgrimage. They ordered pilgrims coming from outside Makkah to circumambulate al Kaaba in Quraysh uniform clothes. But if they could not afford them, men were to do so in a state of nudity, and women with only some piece of cloth to hide their groins. Allah says in this concern, O children of Adam, take your adornment by wearing your clean clothes while praying and going round the tawaf of the Kaaba, 731. If men or women were generous enough to go round al Kaaba in their clothes, they had to discard them after circumambulation for good. When the Meccans were in a pilgrimage consecration state, they would not enter their houses through the doors but through holes they used to dig in the back walls. They used to regard such behavior as deeds of piety and God-fearing. This practice was prohibited by the Quran. It is not albur, piety, righteousness, etc. that you enter the houses from the back but albur is the quality of the one who fears Allah. So enter houses through their proper doors, and fear all of that you may be successful. 2. 189. Such was the religious life in Arabia, polytheism, idolatry, and superstition. Judaism, Christianity, Maginism, and Sabianism, however, could find their ways easily into Arabia. The migration of the Jews from Palestine to Arabia passed through two phases. First, as a result of the pressure to which they were exposed, the destruction of the, their temple, and taking most of them as captives to Babylon, at the hand of the king Bukhtanasar. In the year BC 587 some Jews left Palestine for Hias and settled in the northern areas whereof. The second phase started with the Roman occupation of Palestine under the leadership of Roman Butts in 70 AD. This resulted in a tidal wave of Jewish migration into Hias, and Yathrib, Kaibar and Tema, in particular. Here, they made proselytes of several tribes, built forts and castles, and lived in villages. Judaism managed to play an important role in the pre-Islam political life. When Islam dawned on that land, there had already been several famous Jewish tribes, Kabir, Al-Mustalik, and Nadir, Kareza, and Kanuka. In some versions, the Jewish tribes counted as many as 20. Judaism was introduced into Yemen by someone called Asad Abi Karb. He had gone to fight in Yathrib and there he embraced Judaism and then went back taking with him two rabbis from Bani Kareza to instruct the people of Yemen in this new religion. Judaism found a fertile soil there to propagate and gain adherence. After his death, his son Yusuf Dunawas rose to power, attacked the Christian community in Najran and ordered them to embrace Judaism. When they refused, he ordered that a pit of fire be dug and all the Christians indiscriminately be dropped to burn therein. Estimates say that between 20-40,000 Christians were killed in that human massacre. The Quran-related part of that story in Al-Baruj, Zodiacal Science Chapter. Christianity had first made its appearance in Arabia following the entry of the Abyssinian, Ethiopian, and Roman colonists into that country. The Abyssinian, Ethiopian, colonization forces in league with Christian missions entered Yemen as a retaliatory reaction for the iniquities of Dunawas and started vehemently to propagate their faith ardently. They even built a church and called it Yemeni al Kaaba with the aim of directing the Arab pilgrimage caravans towards Yemen and then made an attempt to demolish the sacred house in Makkah. Allah, the Almighty, however did punish them and made an example of them here and hereafter. A Christian missionary called Fimin, and known for his ascetic behavior and working miracles, had likewise infiltrated into Najran. There he called people to Christianity, and by virtue of his honesty and truthful devotion, he managed to persuade them to respond positively to his invitation and embrace Christianity.
The principal tribes that embraced Christianity were Ghassan, Taglib, Tai, and some Himyarite kings as well as other tribes living on the borders of the Roman Empire. Maginism was also popular among the Arabs living in the neighborhood of Persia, Iraq, Bahrain, LAHSA, and some areas on the Arabian Gulf Coast. Some Yemenis are also reported to have professed Maginism during the Persian occupation. As for Sabianism, excavations in Iraq revealed that it had been popular amongst Kaldanian folks, the Syrians and Yemenis, with the advent of Judaism and Christianity. However, Sabianism began to give way to the new religions, although it retained some followers mixed or adjacent to the Magians in Irakan, the Arabian Gulf. The Religious Situation Such was the religious life of the Arabians before the advent of Islam. The role that the religions prevalent played was so marginal, in fact it was next to nothing. The Palaithists, who faked Abrahamism, were so far detached from its precepts, and totally oblivious of its imminent good manners. They plunged into disobedience and ungodliness, and developed certain peculiar religious superstitions that managed to leave a serious impact on the religious and socio-political life in the whole of Arabia. Judaism turned into abominable hypocrisy in league with hegemony. Rabbis turned into lords to the exclusion of the Lord. They got involved in the practice of dictatorial subjection of people and calling their subordinates to account for the least word or idea. Their sole target turned into acquisition of wealth and power even if it were at the risk of losing their religion, or the emergence of atheism and disbelief. Christianity likewise opened its doors wide to polytheism, and got too difficult to comprehend as a heavenly religion. As a religious practice, it developed a sort of peculiar medley of man and God. It exercised no bearing whatsoever on the souls of the Arabs who professed it simply because it was alien to their style of life and did not have the least relationship with their practical life. People of other religions were similar to the Palaithists with respect to their inclinations, dogmas, customs and traditions. The recording is done through e-reader app. The computer may make mistakes in pronouncing Arabic dictions. The script is hereby displayed for better understanding. The mistake may also be appeared in script while editing owing to human error. The Almighty Allah, the All-Forgiving, may forgive us. Amin.